Okay, I managed to find a deal on an ET3400A on eBay, and I snatched that up, and that is sitting here. It is the one here on the left, as compared to the original ET3400 that I viewed in the last video. Um, the first thing you can notice, this one is a little bit cleaner uh, than this original one here, which was kind of yellowed and dirty. And Some people said that the aging on this one gave it character, but I kind of like the cleaner look on this one. But that's just a cosmetic thing. There are actually some differences between the 3400 and the 3400A. The primary difference is the CPU. This CPU is Motorola 6808, or this is a 6800. You'll notice this one has a clock uh, crystal right here, whereas this one does not have a crystal. It has an external clock IC, which is actually buried up inside of here someplace, and it actually came with a resistor capacitor oscillator driving that clock, and if you watched the previous, previous video, you saw where I took the uh, resistor and um, capacitor out and I soldered a crystal in in its place uh, so that I could use the expansion adapter with the expansion unit and run basic. This one you don't have to do that particular modification to do the expansion because the crystal's already there you don't have to fuss with it. It also has a few of the lines already run down here to the expansion adapter so there was um, a clock line uh, which I think came from uh, somewhere over here in an RE line, which also I think came from somewhere over there that had to be run down underneath and a diode had to be installed. You don't have to do that stuff on this one here. The uh, the clock and the RE are already run. You do still have to, to hook up the expansion adapter. You do still have to hook up a piece of ribbon cable, which comes right here you can kind of see where it comes up through there uh, to hook up those eight data lines and run them down here uh, to hook into the expansion connector so generally adding the expansion connector to an ET3400A is simpler than adding it to the original ET3400 because all you have to do is the ribbon cable you don't have to do the um, clock modification or the RE line and the diode and that's another advantage to the 3400A is um, Heath did make a 6809 adapter. Uh, this is not the original Heath 6809 adapter. This is my uh, clone of it. Uh, but you can take this, you can pull out the 6808, and you could slap the adapter in there. You can you can do that too on the ET3400, the original one. But you also have to go inside and mess with the clock chip and remove it and insert something that rewires some of the clock line. So using the 6809 adapter, much simpler on the 3400A. The other change you will notice, there is a change to the RAM chips. These are 2112 RAM chips and it takes four of them. These are 2114 RAM chips and it just takes two of them. One other thing I also noticed is the 3400A has an additional IC here. No, I don't know what it does. I'm sure the schematic would tell you what it does, uh, but it wasn't there on this. So I'm assuming something to do um, with the changes in the 6808 microprocessor. So one remaining difference, the original one has a two-pin power plug. This new one came with a three-pin power plug. Other than that, the units are pretty simple. They operate the same, so examine um, FC00. Examine FC00. They work pretty much the same. If you find one on eBay and you have a choice, I do recommend getting the newer one over the older one just for those advantages in hooking up the expansion and in using the 6809 adapter. Now the ET3400A that I snagged on eBay also came with some other goodies here. So we have the original manual for it. Nice quality Heath kit manual. I think I showed the manual on the um, ET3400 as well. Um, the 3400A manual is, seems quite similar. Tell you how to put the thing together if you'd have bought it as a kit. And it came with a couple of the original uh, textbooks that came with it. So we've got continuing education uh, microprocessors. There's two books. This one has some audio cassettes that came with it. Yeah, this would be what you'd do if you wanted to. Whoops, audio tape fell out. If you wanted to learn uh, about microprocessors back in the day, this is a uh, Heathkit manual. Look, there's some 
manual annotation someone did as they were working through the exercises. This thing was actually used by someone to learn about microprocessors. A lot of stuff about programming, addressing modes, how the memory addressing works. It's AE3401. And the other manual here, what's interesting about it is it goes into interfacing. So it would tell you um, there's a static RAM, some memory, how it's set up, um, programming experiments, but the cool part here will get into interfacing experiments. Now you can find this online, um, but uh, the, having the actual book is kind of neat. You know, it's telling you how to wire up some experiments on your trainer. You know, here's um, how to wire up a seven segment display to it, as well as the programming that goes with that. It's wiring up some input switches. Digital to analog conversion circuit. Is there anything on serial interfacing? I bet there is. Oh, we got some kind of schematic here. Oh, cool. Cool. Here is the fold out schematic for the trainer. That's nice because you can find this schematic online, but it's not always the clearest thing. Um, some of them are a little bit fuzzy, so I have an original here. A nice find there. Let's put one of these tapes in and see what it does. Got that plugged in. Yeah, it's powered up. Let's push the play button. At the front of the first lesson binder is a section entitled Course Objectives and Outlines. We'll pause long enough for you to find this section. Well, he sounds very official. On completion of this course, now open your binder to Unit 1, Number Systems and Codes. Turning to page 1-3, we find a brief introduction that sets the tone for the lesson. Open during your progress through the unit. When you can perform all of the actions described here, you are ready to take the unit examination. Mm -hmm back and review it until you've got it. This test is the climax of the unit. Answer all of the questions and then check your work against the answers given. If you make a poor showing on the unit... Whoa! What is up with my tape player? Be sure to review. Huh. Okay, I'm going to see if I can go ahead and put together an experiment to use an analog to digital converter on this trainer. So I have first part of this is going to be to connect um, a 6821 PIA chip. So I'm going to go ahead and do that first, and then we will wire in the A to D. Well, that is a lot of wires, and we haven't even hooked up the A to D converter yet. We're actually going to have to get out a second breadboard and run the data lines over to the uh, A to D converter. Well, this is a lab to take an ADC0804 analog to digital converter, interface it through a 6821 PIA into the trainer and display the value on the LED display. So what this will do once we execute it is continuously read this A to D converter. Um, it does a start conversion, then it waits for the interrupt to fire when the conversion is complete, and then it displays the value on the screen. So the instructions had me type in this program, so various hex addresses and various uh, values to put in those addresses. If we examine, we can see all of the values that I quite laboriously typed in there and uh, verified were correct. And now we're ready to hit do 0000 and run the program. So right now it says 42, 
if we turn the potentiometer counterclockwise it will go down all the way down to zero if we turn it clockwise it will go up all the way to 48 so 48 representing 4.8 volts and zero representing zero volts uh, now you may notice that it skips some numbers in between so it goes from 48 to 45 to 42 to 38 etc and the reason for that is even though this is an 8-bit A to D converter they only took the top four bits and used it in a lookup table to know what number to display and the reason they did that is just to keep the size of the program small using a 16 entry table rather than a 256 entry table but this uh, circuit wood is actually providing 8 bits of precision even if you can't um, quite see it now it's time to tear all that hard work back apart boom we just deleted the program from memory pull all these jumper wires out If you watched my previous video, then you're probably aware that I created a clone of the ETA3400, the memory and I.O. accessory that goes with the ET3400. This, again, is the clone that I built. It has a little plastic case with some magnets that will attach to the bottom of the ET3400. Under here is a Raspberry Pi 0W. The 0W is completely optional and it's just used as a terminal. You can also use a DB25 that comes out the back. And what we have here is basically a 6821, a static RAM, and an EEPROM. Actually an EEPROM, the electronically erasable variety. In the last video I did not try out the cassette interface, but I have since got the remaining parts that I need for the cassette interface, this uh, comparator, and I've wired it up and we're going to try it out in this video. So let me plug the Pi back into there make sure I got it properly centered um, and again the Pi is completely optional you could use the DB25 serial out if you wanted to this just hooks in and substitutes to the serial lines and then we take our ET3400 we put it on top connect the cable and we are good to go okay now it's time to try out the cassette interface and see how that works so I have attached my HDMI monitor to the Raspberry Pi which is connected to the serial interface on the trainer and I have attached my USB keyboard to that very same Raspberry Pi and I have loaded a terminal called PicoCom so let's do do 1400 we are now in the monitor we can G1C00 we're now in the tiny basic let's type in a little program print hello print world There's a program, works as expected. Now let's save that program to cassette. So I'm going to turn the cassette player on and switch it to record. So it is recording, and then I'm going to type save. And that should be saving the program. Okay, the save is complete. Stop. Rewind. And then let's see what it sounds like. A little bit staticky. Oh, there we go. Bring that down a little. And there it is. Uh, I think it's like at about 110 baud or so. There is the data stream that was saved out to the cassette tape. So, okay, I'm going to read the program back in. I've reset the trainer. U1400. There is no program loaded, so let's do load and push play. Okay, our program has successfully been loaded from cassette, and we can run it. So that is the cassette interface. It's working just fine. Next, let's see if we can play some games. So let me enter the monitor again, and then we'll this up, we'll do our G C00. And I happen to, on this cassette, have a copy of the tiny basic version of Land of Devastation. So let's pop that in. Let's do our load. 
And that'll take a good five minutes to load. Okay, it has successfully loaded. Let's run the game. Land of Devastation, Tiny Basic Edition. You are wandering in the wasteland. You have 25 out of 25 hit points and two med kits. Let's look for trouble. A hostile bandit. Let's hit the bandit. Ah, we killed the bandit. Well, let's rest. Uh, I tried to rest, but I found trouble instead. A mean dude. Um, let's hit the mean dude. Down to three hit points. I could heal, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push it and just see if try my luck here. I think I can take him down. Oh, he killed me. Well, that was it. That was uh, that was it. We died, and that was the tiny basic version of Land of Devastation. Fairly long program, and I actually dug this up, and it is up in my GitHub repo case you want to play on your trainer the tiny basic version of Landis Devastation. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sandrail stuff. Bye!